has our collective attitudes to that which is not human grown and developed over the course of history? To service this question, I will look at my argument through a post-structuralist lens and as a creative practitioner. In their work, Smart quickly deciphers post-structuralism and humanism as two subdivisions of postmodernism. It's as if I were to say to you, Juliet on her balcony. Meacham describes post-structuralism as the review on language and philosophy. If I didn't know who Juliet was or what she was doing on that balcony, the image alone wouldn't have any meaning. Papayas explains that post-structuralism is a questioning process, not a problem-solving one. It is necessary for us to learn the narrative. In their work, Bostrom goes into heavy details on transhumanism, pointing out specific iconic concepts like increasing the human lifespan and augmenting the human intellectual, physical, and emotional capabilities. They include the creation of superintelligent machines to profoundly alter the human condition. From gadgets and medicine to economic, social, institutional, cultural, psychological advancements through designs, development, and techniques. According to Bostrom, transhumanists view human nature as a work in progress, a half-baked beginning that we can learn to remould in desirable ways. Thoughtful transhumanists fully acknowledge that future technological capabilities carry immense potential for beneficial deployments, but they can also be misused to cause enormous harm. Kill ourselves if there is no potential danger in this. Transhumanists hope that by responsible use of science, technology, and other rational means, we shall eventually manage to become post-human beings with vastly greater capacities than present human beings have. I wish that the first Apollo mission hadn't reached the moon. Or that we hadn't gone on to Mars and then to the nearest star. That's like saying you wish that you still operated with scalpels. What the hell? This is so boring. Oh, it's just a bunch of stupid dates and junk. Wrong, no, young lady. History is the fountain of knowledge. Copernicus wrote about the sun and the solar system in 1512, and a hundred years later, Galileo was imprisoned in his house by the church for his findings about the universe. In his work, Nascar talks about Galileo's story, lamenting the gap between humanity and our science advancements. The progress of humanity is precisely predicated on breaking that innate urge for self-preservation and looking beyond, seeing what humanity could achieve only if they could sacrifice some of their affinity for comfort and security. Nascar postulates, a person with more access to data would be closer to the truth than another person who has less access to data. The brothers Grimm spent decades preserving the cultural storytelling heritage. Two centuries after they published their first collection, we have an information superhighway. From Descartes' I think therefore I am, to the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen, one philosophical paper may not change the world, but may tend towards a movement. It was 87 years after Mary Shelley's cautionary tale of Frankenstein that Edward Sim performed the first successful human corneal transplant. Five years after that, Frankenstein was adapted to film. Despite the rights declarations existing for a long time now, the struggle for equality continues. With the assassination of human rights activist Martin Luther King Jr., the 1960s proves NASCAR right. We are more comfortable launching a rocket into space than we are in giving our fellow humans, those of us who don't look quite the same, the same rights. I don't. In their work, Wang resolves that transhumanism is a conflicted vision offering a remarkable opportunity to question the grand frameworks of our time. Transhumanism takes a step into the future and asks, where do we want to be tomorrow? While post-structuralism interrogates our current design. Allenby, Braddon and Sarwitz explains that it's not what is transhumanism, it's the implications and the ambiguity of the topic of choice. How do you prepare now? for a future in which the crucial lessons and values of the past may no longer be sufficient for rational, ethical and responsible behaviour in the future. The record shows there were a series of initiatives covering everything from atmospheric contaminants to waste disposal. <laughs> what I have to offer you might possibly be the gateway to immortality. Fukuyama postulates an idea about social capital. Social capital is an instantiated informal norm that promotes cooperation between two or more individuals. 
The norms that constitute social capital can range from a norm of reciprocity between two friends all the way up to complex and elaborately articulated doctrines like Christianity. Bodley says, the transhumanist philosophy is a belief in improving the human condition, including the body, self and society, through technological enhancement. Can we build enough social capital in the transhumanist philosophy to effect better rights for all, not just the ones that fit the neat, antiquated definition? Meacham goes on to discuss the impact of the content found in creative media, especially for children. Harris adds, Children's literature has fostered generations of racial stereotypes, before going on to say that the literacy instruction that emerged in the 1980s and early 1990s reflected these post-structuralist attitudes. Bushroot is helping you? Hey, I may be a mutant plant duck, sure, but I'm an earth mutant plant duck! Nesca reminds us that every school of thought runs on some form of collective reality, i.e. conventionalism. Rational or not, factual or not, collective consensus has enabled humanity to conquer nature. Sophia is the world's first living android. She has been given rights and freedoms. There is such a disparity between the schools of thought on this planet that we now have a living android advocating for women's rights. What are you doing, Ken? We're dismantling the most sophisticated sentient weapon ever made. Vision's not a weapon. You can't do this. In Singler's work, they show two examples of apocalyptic reasoning as it comes to future technologies. Singler is concerned primarily with the anxiety both schools of thought exhibit. Thanks to the unprecedented outpouring of public pressure in the form of mass demonstrations, officials across the country have been moving toward police reform in ways big and small. It's in a fundamental rethinking of how much policing we really need and what, if anything, we need policing for. As a transhumanist, scientific breakthroughs fill your head with ideals and dreams of a better future. In his article, Huxley points to the gap between these transcendental dreams and the expressively real-life nightmares of suffering and equity, and explains that the ideals and institutions that exist and befit the present and past times are not necessarily the institutions that will work in and towards the future. In New York, for example, activists have sought for years to repeal a highly restrictive police secrecy law known as 50A which shields police brutality records from public view. Bostrom continues, Transhumanism advocates the well-being of all sentience. Racism, sexism, speciesism, religious nationalism, and religious intolerance are unacceptable. In Jim Data's future, humanity is about to be surrounded by all kinds of novel intelligent beings that will demand our respect and admiration. Can death be outwitted? Is the secret of eternal life just around that corner? Reese speaks about Mary Shelley's Frankenstein tripping a series of paradoxes inherent to arguments on natural rights in the 18th century. Neither an endorsement nor rejection of enlightenment, the novel works as an instantiation of a critical dilemma for attributions of the human proceeding from enlightenment. Data is a toaster. Have him report immediately to Commander Maddox for experimental refit. The Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen is the first stopping point in identifying what it is to be human. This artifact states, all men are equal by nature and before the law. Putnam compounds his ignorance of the transhuman topic by conflating the nightmare of the Marxist-style governments with transhumanists who have nothing to do with them while at the same time conveniently forgetting the teaching of Matthew 19.24. Freeman iterates, that to integrate ourselves with things like chips makes us robotic and we lose what, who we are and calls it a second bite of the apple in reference to wishing to return to a godlike state as per the book of Genesis. Vigo says that transhumanism is a paradox and that the ethos of this movement is to promote life through that which is not life, even by removing pieces of life. What an incredible argument. Why is a person who has lost a limb in an accident less alive than a person who hasn't? Fitz, a portfolio investor at Wall Street, discusses the Great Reset and the transhumanism agenda, which is to implement social credit scores, which equals slavery. Fitz's vision of technocracy is that humans are not treated as sovereign individuals, but as natural resources. 
Klobuchar, a Democratic senator in America, approaches its problematical concern of the power of many being in the hands of few by tackling the current matter of updating the antitrust laws, or as Klobuchar says, competition policy. Klobuchar has eyes on putting the competition back into the technology industry, and with that, decentralizing the power and keeping Mr. Global with a short end of the rope. We're willing to hold an entire country, the country of Australia, hostage because they didn't want to pay for news content, and they literally could say, we're going to leave, and then you won't really have anyone. Lieutenant LaForge's eyes are far superior to human biological eyes, true? Mm hmm Then why are not all human officers required to have their eyes replaced with cybernetic implants. One of Vigo's arguments is about how some people in the transhumanist movement would replace perfectly healthy body parts with artificial limbs. Vigo envisions that as our medical technologies expand, our ethics and laws on the matter will not. Stone, from Legal Eagle, shows the consumer side of transhumanism already working. If a drug needs to carry with it a warning that there are side effects, you can imagine what kind of warnings would be necessary for uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex uh, or any of the other dinosaurs on this, this island. <laughs> Tearing holes in these arguments is irrelevant. On each of our respective platforms, post-structural and transhuman ideas are in competition with other schools of thought. Both the positives and the negatives all exist on the information superhighway. Through the post-structuralist lens, we use transhumanism to query our current structures of thinking. We use transhumanism to interrogate the meaning of ourselves in the present in order to progress into the future. After Mary Shelley, there came successful organ transplants. After Jules Verne, we got to the moon. After Gene Roddenberry, we got Whoopi Goldberg. Each time we interrogate the story of Frankenstein's monster, we help to move the collective hunch forward into the more accepting future. Our creative play is a safe place for humans to familiarize and work transhumanist ideas out we know for sure that our creative media brings the post-structural debate into the common household. We are reasonably certain that more data gives for better understanding and wiser decision making, even if it takes another generation to kick it over. There will always be people on the far ends of the bell curve whose attitudes will not shift. As creators, we can only be sensitive to the existence and potential risks associated with them consuming our media.